Anya, you know, what can a philosopher bring to medicine and healthcare? This is what you specialized in as a philosopher of biology, looking at uh, some issues in, in, in healthcare. So I, there are lots of different ways that philosophers of biology can engage in questions about medicine, um, questions about classification, evidence, explanation. Um, one of the big issues that philosophers of medicine have been engaged with is how we define disease and as well as how we classify disease. Um, are, is the very concept of disease value laden or can we sort of pick out what diseases are as a matter of sort of natural kinds of things? Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a very old debate in philosophy, this question about what is a natural kind mm -hmm. and how do we carve up nature's mm -hmm. joint, you know, do we, can, can we carve nature at its joints? Um, I was sort of led into these questions when I was diagnosed with cancer about oh. 15 years ago and I started wondering, well, what is cancer? How do we classify it? How do we diagnose it? How do we treat it? Mm. And so the big questions that you know, I've explored grew out of my own experience and interest in, in evidence and medicine and how we justify and explain. So yeah. in, in being, in essence, a philosopher of cancer, <laughs> <laughs> what are the categories of issues that you dealt with? Uh, so first of all, what is cancer? How do we define it as a disease? Um, how do we demarcate early stage cancers from late stage cancers? and um, given that many cells in the body have some of the mutations or changes to cells that are precursors to cancer, so if I wipe the skin off my face, the skin around my eyes, it turns out, has almost the same number of mutations as a skin cancer would, mm. but it isn't a cancer. So how is it that, is it the presence of mutations alone that makes a cancer a cancer, or is a certain kind of organization of the cells and tissues in the body, the behavior of those cells and tissues, um, what makes a cancer cell a cancer cell? That's a sort of interesting question um, that philosophers have debated a bit. And also, how do we classify cancers? Um, how many different kinds of cancers are there? Is there one answer to that? Is there one right answer to that? Or are there different cross-cutting classifications of cancers um, in service of different purposes? Okay, so you, you've been personal, so I'll be personal with you. With yeah. no, nobody, nobody else is watching, so you and I okay. can talk about this. <laughs> so uh, I've had a, a, a life history of, of what's called actin keratosis, which mm. are pre-cancerous skin cancer. Awesome. And the odds are, I don't know, 1% to 5% that any of them would turn into a cancer, but still that's high, so you have to get rid of it through cryogenetics or surgery or something mm -hmm. else. So I've had various things... Uh, that I have a little pock marks here, here and there. But then I've also had more recently, um, um, th then there's basal cell cancers, squamous cell cancers, all skin mm. cancer. And then of course, melanoma. I have not had that, but I've had squamous cell. Do you have a family history? Yeah. Um, uh, not really, but- Really, wow, uh, okay. I think I've had, uh, you know, had, uh, maybe one aunt has had a series of, of skin uh, cancers. But you know, I have light skin. When I was a child, I was in the sun a lot, and mm -hmm. you know, you have that. So I mean, that that division seemed pretty clear in terms of those four kinds of skin cancers. Mm. Uh, and it's important because some are enormously um, 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 uh, can metastasize very easily. Met melanomas, which mm -hmm. I've not had, and the others uh, have different degrees. But every time I've had an act in keratosis. It's a real pain because mm -hmm. you have to deal with it in one either through chemical or or, or surgical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm and so th that about. kind of differentiation uh, is that an obvious uh, uh, kind of classification? Well, I guess I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. If you mean by obvious, I mean. I mean, I mean, is there anything deep in there? Because there are different kinds of cells and different type of histology that they mm -hmm. they look. Because so is that is that the way. Is that the way uh, um, uh, you would look at determining what the classes are because they're classes by the uh, etiology of it, the prognosis of it, the, the likely treatment of it, each mm -hmm. of it, their own categories? So yeah, historically, um, cancers were typically categorized in terms of the site of origin, right? And the cell and tissue type of origin. So a certain type of skin or tissue and where it arose, right? Um, now there are lots of different ways of categorizing cancer in terms of not just the cell of origin, but of course, historically also stage and grade. So extent of differentiation and how far it's invaded, right? 
um, size, um, shape. It depends on the type of cancer, which of those things are more or less significant. Um, obviously, solid tumors are different from other kinds of cancers. Mm -hmm. um, and now there are various other molecular biomarkers that are used to subclassify cancers in service of various kinds of prognoses and treatment decisions. Um, Though the closer we look at cancers, the more heterogeneous they are. So every cancer is in some sense genetically unique mm. because they arise in distinct cells and tissues in different individuals. In order of magnitude, if you had to say how many kinds of cancers which are sufficiently different that you would call them some kind of a kind, some kind, it doesn't have to be a natural kind, but some kind, I mean, are we dealing with dozens or hundreds? Well, so I thought there would be one answer to that question. And when I started looking, I opened up a bunch of textbooks yeah. and um, I thought, oh, I could just count them up. Yeah. And it turns out there's no widespread agreement on this. Mm. Um, some people say 200, some people say 500, some people say 5,000. Okay. But that all depends on how you're counting. Of course. Um, That's why a philosopher is needed. <laughs> well, and but I think my answer to that question is I, I sort of thought as a philosopher I would be able to sort that out. And my answer is, that's the wrong question. Okay. <laughs> there is no one right classification of cancers. There's actually multiple different ones. They serve different purposes. What you're interested in as a surgeon or a radiologist might be very different from what you're interested in as a molecular biologist studying uh, the basic mm -hmm. biology of cancer or an epidemiologist studying patterns in cancer incidence in certain populations. In principle, you would have thought they all nicely line up in a hierarchy and right, that they would right. all neatly align. Right. But it turns out that when they started looking at the genetic variation within and across cancers, that they found that cancers arise in different tissues of the body might have more in common genetically, right? Rather than cancers, um, wow. you would think that that would that they would neatly align such that cancers that arose in different tissues would be more right. similar genetically. So that's not necessarily true. So that's a really interesting puzzle, right? It turns out that it's not as neatly organized mm -hmm. as we thought. How yeah. about issues of uh, screening, testing, treatment? Um, we're t we always constantly hear uh, thoughts that there are things that are over-tested and over-treated. And, and you know, prostate cancer in males is an example where it, there's been thoughts that has been over-treated because uh, it's a slow-growing cancer, and people who get it at 70 or 80, I mean, they're going to die, but not from that. Mm -hmm. No yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah. So are those real issues to be concerned about that Absolutely. philosopher can engage with? Yeah, and it looks like maybe not even prostate cancers, but some other cancers, like possibly also thyroid cancers and some breast cancers. If You, you, you might think, well, screening early and often is a good yeah. thing, yeah. but of course not all cancers progress uniformly. Um, so those slow growing or indolent cancers, like some of the prostate cancers, you don't necessarily want to treat them aggressively um, and act right away. But if you have a highly sensitive test, you might find more cancers and then overdiagnose <laughs> and overtreat. Um, and, uh, and so as I understand now, there are some genetic markers that people are hoping we might be able to use to determine which of those prostate cancers are the fast growing ones, mm -hmm. the more aggressive ones, and which ones you want to sort of watch and wait. Um, and uh, that's a new thing. The idea that less is more is actually a new idea yeah, in cancer. Right. That I mean, this, I think people tend to assume we want more screening, we want more treatment, we want more aggressive treatment, but watching and waiting might be the better bet. And there are also some open debates about what counts as good or good quality evidence and how we rank different kinds of evidence in medicine and how different kinds of research in medicine has different standards and how we compare and contrast and integrate information across these different domains. So sort of public health and epidemiology will use case control or cohort studies where we're looking at patterns, correlations mm -hmm. over time, as opposed to randomized clinical trials. And sort of evidence-based medicine paradigm is the idea that the highest form of evidence, the gold standard as it were, is a randomized clinical trial where everything else sort of falls short of that. And the, the number of philosophers of, of science and medicine and biology have sort of questioned and challenged that way of thinking in terms of a hierarchy and argue that actually, um, in some contexts, some kinds of evidence are rather more important. And I think that came out especially in the context of the pandemic. Um, so public health ep epidemiologists and people who do the sort of research that relies on randomized clinical trials might be looking at different kinds of evidence and ranking them differently, regarding them differently 
And some kinds of things you can't really do a randomized clinical trial on, so you might want to have the sorts of evidence the public health scientists. And, and so the, the, the fundamental point is, is that you really need to think carefully about the, the structure of the question and the kinds of evidence that is optimally suited for it, and there's no absolute standard that would fit everything. Of course, and how we integrate different kinds of evidence in service of public health policy um, this arises in the context of screening, but it also arises in the context of public health recommendations for things like uh, managing the pandemic and determining what kinds of interventions we, we ought to be using. We have the best quality evidence for 